Thank you guys. Um, yeah. uh, thank you for being here. Uh, right now, I'm just going to show 3D Max and how I use it to make uh, a game. Right now, I'm going to end with Unreal Engine. I'm going to show you guys. Um, this is this uh, with what I started with. It's called a third person uh, starter. So this is what you start off with, with the Unreal Engine using the third person template. Uh, this is what I have so far. I started using Unreal Engine back in like uh, November, I'd say, of, of last year. Um, I, when I used to uh, practice my game design, and uh, my characters, I would use uh, Torque 3D for the, for the engine. This is what I have so far. Right now, you play as a military guy, but uh, we're going to change that, and we're going to go more with a civilian. Right now, he can shoot. He has an AK-47. He can throw a grenade, but as you can see, he doesn't have the animation to throw it. Uh, he can sprint and he can aim so you can have because uh, if you go like that it's kind of hard to aim but if you hold shift you can just aim straight forward to the camera right now i have this is supposed to be downtown mccallan there's the bar 201 but i renamed it to 9564 uh, right now if you get near this light you get zombies spawn and they come at me try to kill me my health is up there in the top bottom now it's 200 And also have this um, kind of boss guy. He's walking in and kills me. Um, he only has one attack right now. Right now, also, I'm not kind of dead. I have to program that in to release the player. So, I'm going to show how I kind of those characters in 3D Max and I'm uh, mostly um, this is 3D Max once you get it um, by default the rendering um, you kind of have to change it because it's more set up right now to using those very powerful rendering tools that I was talking about like V-Ray and Ray Trace which I honestly I don't know how to use those but I knew I kind of read about them and I just know that they're used to uh, to render realistic uh, scenes and if you go to these custom it was right here to rendering or uh, custom and custom ui and default switchers you kind of have to put it back to the default and i think it's here with mental ray and it has all these other renderers that is different mostly for the textures I already changed it. So right now when you open 3D Max, it has the classic four viewport and you got your top view, your front view, your left view, and your perspective. Me mainly, I just like to work on my perspective view. So I click over here to just zoom on the perspective one. And so you have this empty world. And this, what it is is a, a 3D, it's three dimensions. So you got your X, Y, and Z coordinates. All it is is just points and space and certain uh, three and three certain specific dimensional points dimensions <clears throat> right now um, right here is your 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 tools to build your primary primary uh, what do you call it polygons you got your box your cone these are like for advanced uses for uh, most of the time I just start with a box and you can just click and drag it anywhere Right now, the the shading is set to realistic. What I like to change is to shade it, so you don't really. Um, it does take a lot more uh, power from your computer, and it takes a long time when you have a lot of stuff and it's on realistic. It takes a while to render and stuff, so you can see how the shading works. But <coughs> I just like to take it off, and then when I want to look at how it looks and realistic, I'll change it. <laughs> and right now it's in a perspective view, which is kind of very limited when you start um, playing around, moving the camera around. It starts too hard to control because it, 
a perspective view is more of a the eye view I would say like something like this and there's something another view that I like most and it's called an orthographic view uh, it's more of a, an isometric out, out thing um, don't call me on that one and this one it's more easier to, co to control the camera to the viewport but you do need to have something selected if I deselect that um, it would be like very hard to find it. Yeah. I don't want to select it. And you get this really view on. Right now, my keys that are using is if I hold down the Alt key and the middle mouse button, I can pan the camera around. These, these tools are very important on how to navigate around this 3D space and using this camera. When you have something selected, let's see, I want to have another box over right here. Another box right here. When you have nothing selected, it's very hard to get to like, you know, the corner that I want to get to. So you want to select that box. And now, you see how the camera will just rotate around the selected thing. <coughs> Right now, these are just uh, regular boxes. You want to convert them in something that's called edible poly. A poly is a polygon, it's short for polygon, and a polygon is just a face with sides. It could have from three to more sides. Right now, these have, each poly has four sides to make it a square. And so it's very basic geometry. Um, right now, I'm gonna right click it. You right click on the object and you go to com convert. All these other options too, uh, some of them, um, you, they're kind of advanced and it is kind of hard to, for me it was hard to figure out which ones like to use for game, you know. Um, right now, when you convert something to it has edible mesh, edible poly, convert to deformable G poly, edible patch, convert to nerve. What, what, what I what is meant to be used in the industry is these two mesh is the first one that started off and mesh is always triangular there even uh, it triangulates for you you make a square but it still just cuts it in half uh, and everything is triangle no matter what and in poly uh, it looks like it's not but actually also it is, does triangulate it for you so everything is just triangles inside the world but you also, when, well, this might be easy, easy, but you do want to keep, uh, when it comes to character design, you want to keep your polys to four sides. So you can only have squares. And if you must, you use three sides as a triangle. And the reason for that is because you want to subdivide your, your model. And when you subdivide a four-sided uh, polygon, it subdivides perfectly. And when you subdivide something else, it doesn't. And when you're subdividing, you're making the, uh, a higher, higher polygon count. So you need that higher polygon count to make detail on the sculpture that I'm going to show. Uh, this 3D Max is only to, to do something called the low poly, the low polygon mesh, which is considered from anywhere or from four, from, from one poly to like, 14,000 polys in the AAA industry right now, you kind of, for a character, and depending on what it's gonna be in, it's gonna be like 4,000 squares per character. 14, zero to 14,000 depends, but even in like the games like Last of Us, they'll use a cube for that, you know? So even in next gen games, they still use cubes. It just faked in the texture. A lot of it is just faked on the texture. And I'm gonna show you that, how to do all that. Uh, right now, I just want to go to the controls of the Max and how to um, how I use them. Once I convert it to an edible poly, you have your tools over here. Right here, you can select the type because um, uh, the poly you can it has vertex. Vertex are the corners. Um, right now, also I like to right click here, uh, on perspective and configure and take away these options. The select brackets is the bracket that you guys see these. I don't like to see those. And these selected phases, I like to turn those on when I need them and I, you can do that with the F keys. 
um, like let's say you see what I selected that's the, the, the face right now it just looks red on the on the edges but the one that I deselected well it was by default it was like that you know and I don't want that so I want to just turn on turn on whenever I do you need me to you do that by F2 and your F like F2 and F3 are also very useful you turn into wireframe because sometimes you, you do need the wireframe to, to look at things right. <coughs> and the F4, that's a, the other thing that I selected also, this piece. What you have selected and what you don't have, they're different colors over here. But the edges, they stand out. And sometimes I don't want them to stand out, so I'll just push F4 and make them go away. So. Like playing video games did help me out a lot and uh, macroing, I don't know if you, I used to play World of Warcraft a lot and like my skills, everything was macro, like I used Q, W, E, G, V for my skills and everything yeah. like that. So that actually helped me out a lot because here in 3D Max, Q is to select the object. Well, you, and W is if you want to move it. Uh, this thing is called the... Got this. Plane. <coughs> yeah, this thing has a name. Uh, the three, the X, Y, and Z thing. Axis. The axis. The X, the axis. Uh, sounds about right. But, there's <laughs> about right. but okay. So what was that? Yeah, we'll call it. Well, this axis is very important as well. Um, as you can see over here, it, it tells you the three <coughs> the three dimensions of the no, the center of that object, and it's this number, and this number, and it's at zero. X, as you can see, is this. This is X, and this is Y, and this is Z. Um, you can just use like that, move it like that. Um, also, this the axis. Also, um, if you don't want it to be there, you can actually put it wherever you want, and it would be in this tab. No. <coughs> yeah, in this tab, the higher tab. All these tools, it really takes time to to learn them, and I would really suggest also the F1 menu. Uh, or have internet. But when you have an internet, you push F1 and it will turn <coughs> you to the help. So that was very helpful. Because all these, you really have to know what they do. And this right here is where you would draw your your primitives, or it also has another extensive, like the hydro, you can draw a hydro, or whatever that is. Ring wave. Capsule. <coughs> Are, are the basic uh, when you here is where you're gonna modify your poly. This one, and you got your hierarchy over here. What I was talking about, where you can affect the pivot point. It will, uh, it's called the pivot point, and you can affect that and move it anywhere you want. That way, when you rotate, it'll pivot from that from the origins. And here, with, uh, these tools are over here, like the Q to select, the W to move. Do they have libraries, like let's say if you work so hard to create, let's say a building or a landmark or something like that, I know in Photoshop or in other tools, you can go to libraries and grab objects that somebody else created. Like I, I don't want to start yeah. creating everything. I can just say, you know what, create me a uh, football field. Mm -hmm. Somebody took a long time to create that and shared it. And just pop it in there. There are websites like TurboSquid where okay. people also, they just depend, there are some are free, some charge, okay. but there are more websites like that one where they people do their 2D art and they're shared. You can do that. Um, okay, these tools, where I was going to, you can select. 
the phase and so you can move it anywhere you want to start creating or you can grab the edge <coughs> and move that, that edge or you can move uh, grab the vertices and move it wherever you want or you can select, select the whole element and move it wherever you want and then uh, I'm going to go over some other tools that are very useful once I like to when you delete one of those, um, you can grab an edge, and if you hold shift, you, you just create another body, and you just kind of go like that with shift. <coughs> but you do have to make sure um, if there uh, the, the poly that was there, it does have to be empty here. Uh, if it wasn't empty, it wouldn't pull out the edge like that, because you do kind of have to have an opening, because it was, that one was already sealed. And let's say um, I want to do, I'm going to get rid of this. Um, let's say I want to do a triangle here. I don't want to do another square. So for this edge to to connect to something else, I have to deconnect it from here. So I'm going to delete that. And in here, in poly mode, because each of these have different tools as well. Um, some are the same, like extrude and weld and chamfer, which I'm going to explain right now. But the poly has a uh, very uh, unique, um, unique tool where you want to, it's just called create. And you, you click on it, and then you just click on the vertices for the poly that you want to create. And I want clicked on those three, so it creates it. I didn't click on that one, obviously, because I just clicked on random space. And then there's this other tool on the vertex one when you get this and it says target weld and you click on this and it will them back to that. So um, knowing all these tools is essential to creating the model that you guys want. Right now I'm going to show a 3D character that I've made. does have the processor of a, it's a, a quad core Intel multi thread. So when it comes to rendering, what really matters is the video card, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like uh, like how many gigabytes worth of memory do you think would be like worthwhile for like good video? Uh, for the video cards, I would suggest more to get the uh, GGDR5. More <coughs> worry about that than the memory with the memory. Because if you get like a GGR3 or a GGR4, and it, let's say you get the GGR4 and it's two gigs, the GGR5, 512 is gonna be with it. So just make sure you, you know, have the most. Is, is, is that have to do with the GPU that's used on the video card? Yes, because nowadays also, the all the games are moving more to GPU based than CPU based. So having the GPU is better is better too, for video games. For, them for them to make better, to look better. Oh wow, so like when you're rendering a video, it wouldn't even touch, like, it just, oh never mind, no, it's like, it's like, like it doesn't even touch the computer processing engine, it does everything on the graphics. Uh, I'm not sure if it does everything on the graphics card right now, but a lot of the stuff is done, but I think it's sure uh, the process is still being used as well. Yeah, it'll, it'll do a lot on the, on the graphics card because what it's doing, like, graphics card's really do good at doing, like, continuous lines of code, and the CPU is more for, like, a random code coming in, like, it, you want to open a window and you want to do this, but if you want a graphics card, like, put a pixel, like, this place over and over and over again, it's better at that, so it'll, it'll use the, the GPU one in there. Plus, both are still being used, right? Yeah. Uh, it uses it a little bit, like, but it's mainly going to tax the, the GPU. And that also depends on the developer, because the developer, the developer is the one that chooses 
fact that it's going to be more GPU based and more CPU based. But well, like the render time, because I remember I had a roommate of mine that used Maya, and I remember he would do like a video, and he's like, oh, it's going to take two days for that to render. And like, you know, I'd yeah. be like, how does that work? Is that like all that processing power is going coming from the GPU? Or is to it be just honest, like I wouldn't know that one. It has to go to the CPU to get the keys. Whatever you're doing is interacting, it has to go to the CPU. But all the rendering is done with yeah, but how would you minimize that time? Do you get like higher, like more? Do you it, it, it would depend um, mm -hmm. more on an AMD card would be better <coughs> than uh, like say an NVIDIA, but it would really depend on the amount of data that the graphics card can actually process. Uh, like uh, I think it's like teraflops of, of uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> the amount of data that that particular card would be able to uh, to transfer through. But like for movies and stuff, like where they have the big rendering. It is just rendering farms. Like, there's nothing that a personal computer can like compare right. to that. So oh, okay. Maybe okay. even like yeah. cloud-based rendering, like what they're yeah. talking about last week. Because yeah. I heard about that, that like yeah. they would use a lab to use parallel computing to like render more quickly. Otherwise, it would take like weeks. Yeah. 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 If you do a uh, smart mm -hmm. way to cut that time down, would be having multiple computers because you tell the computer what to render. So you, let's say you have three computers. Mm -hmm. The first computer you can say will render the first three minutes, and then the other computer. Or render for a three five and then the other okay, computer later. So they all start at the same time. So you do our cutting in it's cool. It's cool. <coughs> so we'll use that. Right now this is a spider lady that I mentioned that I did. And right now as I mentioned is that I don't like to see the wire frame on it, so I'll I'll do a F four. So take that away. Um this lady I I had I started off from, let's see what I can pull it out. Okay. I got her. Oh, the texture's all messed up. Is that a template that you started with? Yes, yeah, this is the template that I started with. I kind of just got rid of everything, you know. This is another tool that I didn't show. Um, you can select, when you hold down the mouse, you can select, and then um, if you hold here, it'll give you a different ways of selecting stuff. So I kind of went with that, and got the spider lady in, and everything else, which is extruding the edges one by one, you know, and creating them, and also on, let's say, Another tool that I didn't show was it if you grab one edge, if it's missing like that, and then you grab the another edge, you can just bridge it, you know, bridge. And that's why learning these these tools is very important. <coughs> um, let's say I was going to show other tools as well. Um, when you, this extrude, what it does, uh, it will extrude it. Do like that, you know, if you need to extrude. And this bevel, bevel, is also extruding, but uh, it also you can, that's, I think that's what it's called, bevel. You want that fixed. You got the bridge, and then you got the ins in insert. Where it oh, you see how it's in the perspective, and now I think it's like trying to slow down. That's what I meant right now, so that's why the arc of that is really doing really better. Um, and right here in the sides are so you can, you, you don't want to be like dragging it like that, and you want a specific number, you go over here, and then a little window, and right here it'll tell you you can do, I want this point seven. Get on the move to not to it out and whatnot. <clears throat> but um, all these is also there's because there's kind of there's multiple ways of building the character. The the ones the two no, ways that I know is uh, starting from a low poly character, and the other way is starting from a high poly character because you can start with either one, but there's there's pros and cons for each one. Like, um, I wanted to show this sculptures. This is free, um, but it's done by ZBrush. Oh. <coughs> 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 it opened wrong. 
wrong, and this is something going wrong in the software. Uh, well, the sphere needs to be in the center. And it could be the resolution. Well, here you, um, you guys saw, but but when you get your when you get your low poly model, you can import that model into here, and then it subdivides the low poly model and building it. If you have like a character from two thousand polys, let's say, it will build it to like millions of polys. And then you can create, in the sculpture, you can create these wrinkles and stuff on the poly. And once you get that, I'm going to hide her. Because I know I, I should have her. Once you finish your model in, in ZBrush or Sculptures, you save it, and then here you can import it. Import. <coughs> I like to take these options again also. Uh, you really have to dig through the internet to find like what you store. Uh, kind of though some of them are self-explanatory. Like I don't want the materials to be imported, so I just always import it without the materials. The materials I'm gonna worry about here in the event. There, that right there. You see how it's the wireframe, so I don't want that. So I'm gonna do it for again. And this is what I did. <clears throat> with the other model, let me see. <coughs> I'm gonna put up right there because the difference between that's how it looks without without the texture. Without the texture, the four works better. So you can see the squares versus. <coughs> With the texture, it's kind of faking detail. So, a lot of it is faking the textures. So you start with the sphere, and then you color the sphere. And the uh, sculptures, yes, you start. You can start with a sphere and create a character with that. I'm just adding clay, like it's like we adding stuff to it, adding and adding, and then you can also on that. And then, so it's kind of like getting a sphere and then molding it into <coughs> whatever you want. Like, Pulling, pulling it out, and then also as like alpha channels where you could do wrinkles and you could do like like scratches and stuff like that. So you can go into very much detail. And that's with to create sculpting. a model, or is that to create the texture? That's to create the sculpture. The sculpture. Two, two, and that's one of the steps to create the texture. Okay. Because I'm gonna show right now. Um, I have the the other the high poly. This is the high polygon, as you can see, it's one million seven hundred seventy-seven squares. So what you do is um, you get the low poly model, and here, this is another thing that Diddy Max and Maya has. They're called modifier modifiers, and you can do a lot of things from bending to twisting <coughs> to skinning, and this is the one for getting textures in. You're gonna, it's called baking the textures. So it's pretty much gonna, um, you do a, you hit select the low poly model and then you hit with this modifier called projection and it's gonna project anything underneath it. So you're projecting the image of the high poly model into the low poly model. So that's how it's baked. So you're creating a texture called the, you also create like that the normal mix and you create the diffuse mask like that. Um, I'm gonna select this spider lady. Here in the projection, you pick whatever you want to project. So I pick the group one, it's called. And 
this option the cage so you can see if it's inside or outside like you say if this part is still outside the cage and you kind of want anything anything everything underneath the cage and here if you, you can select the amount so you get everything can be underneath the cage or you can also uh, manually select these come out to put everything underneath the cage and once you have that once you have what you want you're gonna you, well having the low poly selected you're gonna go here to rendering and render to texture this tool this I learned this by going uh, on digital turtle digital tutors.com and also I would also recommend lynda.com and I know they charge like 14 bucks a month digital tutors like 25 but it is worth it like, this is where I learned how to do the, these maps and it's called the occlusion occlusion map uh, once you get this ready to text you get this like another bit with a bunch of options uh, you have to make sure it's enabled here enable projection and oh no wonder everything was already selected because I did right now on default this is not selected if you guys are going you have to select it make sure you select that and there's nothing here uh, right here is what you're gonna what textures are you gonna produce so you're gonna put add here and these are the textures that you can do that there's a complete map a specular map a diffuse map a shadows map a lighting map normal black map blend map aqua map light map the only one that i use is this complete map and the normal map the normal map i don't know if anybody knows but it's a it's a, called a bump map that's how you think um where you have a, a flat a flat pan uh, poly and then you can see like it and you can still see 3 ds you can see the brick coming out and I'm going to show uh, <coughs> right now normal map, how normal map looks or might look familiar to you guys or not I don't know if you've seen this type of texture before it's all like weird and bluish and this this is uh, tells the light and how depending on where you're staring at how it's gonna bump it. So this works in a 3D environment rendered in real time. And depending on how the light is, is hitting it or the camera is viewing it, that's how it's gonna bump it. So that's how that's how they they fake these textures. So is that based on the physics that you tell it that is there, like a more glossy or the more glossy is a specular map. Oh, okay. You select the, the physics basically there. The norm, yeah. This, uh, I, I like to use the complete map. And what this complete map also does when you project it, if if your your high poly is colored, it's also gonna project the color. But I like what I personally like is um, right now it's colored peach, and right here is where you select the colors. Then this color is just like um, it's only the base of it but once you add a texture to it it's going to be replaced but right now since it doesn't have a texture it just have these people color on it and i like to use the gray on it and project a gray the 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 gray image of it because so i can then do my own colors in photoshop so when you say projects like what how, how does that happen because usually when you're coloring something like in MS Paint or in, or in Photoshop, you're literally filling a pixel, right? So when you say project, <coughs> uh, what are you doing? You're, you're taking... Uh, uh, it's called baking. Look, I'm going to show right now. It's, where I put add, and then the complete map, and then this pops <coughs> up. And right now, by default, it's 256 by 256, and you don't want that, because that's very low resolution. You want to click on this, and then make it into 20 by 48 by 20 by 48. And you also, right here is where, right here, um, where you're gonna save it at, your file type name, right here, you really have to specify it, because this one right here, a TGA, you don't want a TGA, you want, you want almost like a, a JPEG. I'm gonna just save it there on my, well, these are all the formats that you can save it off as, and the TGA is, is there. Uh, well, 
I want to give you pick. Or it, the bitmap also works, but that one is a lot bigger in size. So you just save it, and then you can choose the quality. And once you do all that, you hit it on this render. And then take it. And then there's their big the map. Oh, they baked them all wrong because I'm sure I have an option wrong. I have to use ex 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 existing channels. I used to use automatic unwrap. I don't want to use that. I don't know why it was selected. To be honest, um, by default, use ex existing channels is selected. I'm going to overwrite that. Um, Okay, I guess not. I'm still rendered. Oh, I didn't want to run. Okay. I'm definitely doing something wrong. Um, oh, okay, it has made this automatic flatten UV modifier on it. Automatically, I don't want that. Okay. I'm gonna try again with the exist existing channels. See. There you go. And that's what I wanted. This is the texture. Um, you can see red there because those are the parts that were not inside the cage. So that's why you want to make sure everything's inside the cage. And this. This setup right there, how I have everything here, I, I did that manually. Um, it's something that I want to talk about also. It, it's called the UV map, and it's called the coordinate. It, it records all the coordinates of each face, so you can know how you want to draw it. And you select it, and it's a modifier, and it has a UV, unwrap UVs. Love these. You open up the texture, and it helps. <coughs> Say I'm gonna select oh, the the faces that I want. Let's say I want them, and then because um, right now what you're doing is you're unwrapping it and you're telling 2D Max how you want those faces to unwrap over here in the 2D in the 2D in the two dimension, so you can color on top of it. And let's say I wanted those to be like how I'm looking at them and. You hit right here, you can do the planner. Again, these options, you kind of have to just, that's why you <laughs> get your hands dirty and like get involved and start messing with them so you can get used to these. And you hit planner. Over here. Also, like right now by default, I can't really select it unless you change to edges and you change over here to freedom. And now you can. You can move it anywhere. And this is, is this. <coughs> right now you're going from 3D to 2D. Yeah, you're unwrapping the 3D image into a 2D image. So, so do you start off by with just a plain white gray model? Mm -hmm. You go from two, uh, 3D to 2D. And the 2D, you color it in what, you're, what you want to color it in? Yeah, because once you project, your image, it's gonna follow your unwrap. That's why you saw, um, you see how these are the legs, how I set them up here, where they unwrap. This is the face, <coughs> how I set up the unwrap. like 20, 20 undos, mm -hmm. but you can change that right here in the configuration. And 
Well, I changed it to like 500 at least because it does help to undo a lot. Sure. <coughs> that it followed my UV maps. <coughs> and then, so this texture, I, I get it into Photoshop, and then I'm color on top of it. But, um, I don't know, I thought I was saving this. Oh, 256, I'm gonna change it. Oh, TK. Bake the texture for me, and then right now it's a 2048 by 2048, and it should have saved it here in my desk. There it is. So now what I do is open this in Photoshop. But now I can delete this projection, and I can delete my if I'm satisfied with my baked texture, I can delete the high poly model. And right now, let's say, well, my, my model is like that, right, with no texture. Right here is your material editor when you push M. These are all the materials that you can assign to select it. How difficult would it be to make, like, an actual animation of that figure, like, left forward leg moving forward, mm -hmm. and then, you know, the right forward leg moving forward? Like, how, it, how do you go about doing something like that? I was, I was going to go over it right now. Um, it is hard because my animation is <coughs> compared to what I see in video games. But uh, um, right now, I guess um, there's over here in this option where you create the cubes and everything all the way to the end, there's something called bones and bifit. What I like to use is this bifit. So you create this bifit and then you can specify how many like, chests and finger links and stuff you want on it. Mm -hmm. And once you have your, your skeletal mesh, this life is how you want it to be. And also, <coughs> you have to make sure your, your mesh is a humanoid and resembles this. You put it underneath the, the, you put it underneath the mesh, and then there's another modifier. The modifier is called skinning. And you hit on that modifier, and then you, you tell that modifier all the bones that you want on that mesh. So like joint wise, you mean? I'm gonna, But let's uh, say so um, something less complicated, not like an actual like I don't know, hex uh, yeah, panel have that or whatever that slash was. Sword. But if you want to make something like a jet, like which pretty much nothing is really moving on a jet, it's just a simple airframe, mm -hmm. um, that would be a lot easier, right? Like if you were just, just to move it like one, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna show you real quick how the animation works. Let's say uh, I have this. This box, right? Right here, this is the timeline. This is the the, the one that specifies time. <coughs> right now, it's at 30, but you can change it right here. If you click here, you can change the end time and the start time. Let's say uh, these are the frames. Remember, it just depends on the game engine and what you're using and what's frames per second it's running. So um, a lot of games are like 30 frames per second, 15 frames per second, 60 frames is the the AAA the one. Let's say I'll do like 300 frames. And that box is there at the beginning. You hit here where it says auto key. And then you want the first key to be there, the, the cube. And then let's say in 50, in 50 frames, I want this square to be over here. And then so you go back here is where your play tools are at. You go back to frames and you hit play. And they'll move it. It will automatically do the, the, the spline for you or whatever it's called. But you do have to make sure you're in auto key. And let's say you want it to go up here. <coughs> so when you go back to zero, you hit play. And it's gonna play those animations. 
And then if you want to render that, you just hit render, you go to render setup, and you have to specify to render your whole scene. Right now it's to 100, but mine was like two something, I don't know. So it's where you would tell it to stop rendering. And then when it's done rendering, uh, you can choose to render it either an ABI or something else. I guess it's just gonna do it as an ABI. But there it is, it's rendering. And that's how it takes time. It's like, okay, now we just have to wait to finish it. And I'm just taking the picture of each frame. No question. Uh, a friend of mine told me, uh, he works at a Dow Automotive. He said that only one out of every five car commercials that we see today actually has a real car in it, all of it's CG. Is that, is that true? Most likely, yes. Really? Um, because nowadays the rendering looks way better than realistic. Like, <laughs> they say, <laughs> so like basically like they say car oh, commercial is not even a car, it's, not, it's, it's like way better. Video. It's more like eye candy. Everything's reflective, everything's shiny. You can see the pores from where you're standing out. You see his pores, you know. You're able to do all that shit with Okay. So I'm just does, curious. It does look way better than realistic. Because you see like a Toyota Tundra, like 2016 or 2015 or whatever, like in a commercial, like, damn, that looks good. You can see everything but it's just reflecting, CG, right? Yeah, you can see everything reflecting off of everything. <laughs> wow. Other, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. No dust. <laughs> like those Nissan trucks can't really jump onto those. So yeah, them. I know. I know. <laughs> but they look really good when they do it. And you're like, you're like yeah. damn, that looks good, but, but it's just CG. It's, it's not even the real car. Anymore. Well, what? It's just... What you want is to to make your product look outstanding to the crowd so you can sell it. Um, a lot of the things that we buy are not what they say. Yeah, no. <laughs> They're close. It's up to the first quarter. Yeah. <laughs> that. They got me hooked on this thing. <laughs> I like the sriracha sauce. The sriracha sauce is awesome. Okay. Well, that was a little bit of this. The skinning part, the, you can see the modifiers right here. So um, did you do that model yourself? Or no, you this model out? already came with the Unreal Engine 4. Okay. There's a lot of models that came with it. So for the characters of um, the game that I'm making right now, I wasn't worried about characters right now. I'm worried about the game mechanics and everything working. And then once I could just switch the art out. That's how you, you just put something, like you guys saw the blue character on 3D Max and then you just switch it up. I'm planning to do my own character. Yes, yeah, you want have a question? No, me no. no. I saw a hand. No. So as you guys can see right here, it looks, it looks, it looks bad. Right, this is, this it's is not very well. It's, it's a little dark, what, what do you mean it's bad? Oh yeah, we As can. you can see, <laughs> Uh -huh. these cuts. Yeah. These. Oh, that's because I didn't set up the skinning right. This is where the hard part comes in, as if you do the skinning manually, um, if you unfold the skin and you hit envelopes, oh, it gives uh, you, you see how <coughs> it's, this mesh is wrong right there. Well, these, are, these, are, these are called envelopes envelopes and each bone has one and so each bone you're going to specify what vertex goes to that bone and how much it weighs on it red so you select your vertices and then you get you go over here now to paint weight tools okay i have my thing on. <coughs> Um, you select the vertices, like right there I selected one, one, there's two are selected. And right here you're going to specify how much it's going to weigh on it. And the full one is going to turn red. That means that all, all of it is concentrated to that bone. 
but it, you can do zero, which none of it contributes to that bone, and point one, self-explanatory. For one is a little bit, this is more and more. And what you want to do is because you're going to divide them by the other bone, this bone is going to use 50% of that, you know, five. And this bone is also going to use five. Because when you twist something like this, bone, this bone is using a little bit of this, stretching this, and this is still part of this bone. So you kind of want to, on each vertices, weigh them to a specific amount so it can look right. So, so I guess to put it in context, say that the person is wearing like a uh, coat. Mm -hmm. You're saying that certain vertices, you want to make them heavier so that when the coat hits air or whatever you want the animation to be, or et cetera, like it, it's not going to spring back all over the place. You, you want it to have some weight. Is that what you're doing? Or? <coughs> yes, because let's say this part right here, uh, you think it's part of just this bone, right? And, but when you fold it like this, this is, this is, is going to follow this bone and it's going to still it's going to go more in you can see a cut right here and it's not going to look real you want them still let's say this is going to be like 0.75 but it's still like 0.25 over here so it won't go in that much over here is, is this uh, that one i kind of learned it the hard way okay by testing and stuff and how it looked right now i did it and because first i would think that all these vertices go with this bone but when actually animating and like twisting it does help that it's more weight on this as well, so it doesn't bend incorrectly because you want it to be realistic. So it, it does, um, like I said, my animating uh, skills are not that great, but I do know on how to start and uh, how to kind of, how to sharpen those skills, you know, because you don't just, are you, we're not just born with these skills, you really have to sharpen them and like put yourself, spend a lot of hours Messing with it. Would it be a fair statement that in, in using V Mark and using similar tools, the person that is behind the, pro, the, the computer really has to be in like an artistic background? Because really, you're starting with the blob, you know, a sphere or whatever, and you're carving it, you're molding it. You're, I mean, did you have previous experience using art and carving and sculpting? Or? Oh, yes. Well, I grew up liking art. I drew up, I would draw. Dragon Ball Z characters and everything. I would really suggest a lot of people are like, yeah, it's because I don't have the imagination or I don't know how to do it. It's because you really, my advice would be start copying and just like uh, drawing what you see. And it's because you do so many that once you've done so many, you can come up with your own. And like all these characters, they're kind of split into sections. Like, uh, I would do first the head, you know, and then you have your shoulders, and then you have your chest, and you have your arms, and then you have your legs. So, kind of working one <coughs> by one, and then putting them together, not just all at once. Yeah. Is this something that somebody can work remotely? Because it seems like that's possible, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't necessarily have to be in California <coughs> to probably work in one of those industries, or? No. <coughs> well, with Winter Leaf Entertainment, I worked with Bug in my house when it was internet based. They were based in uh, on Oklahoma, and they with Winter Leaf Entertainment, we had about 80 people working online, and there were like 20 in their city, you know, and then everybody else was remotely, and they're still going. You know, it looks pretty good. The project was it an internship the whole time? Um, it was, it was kind of an internship, and um, it was more. Uh, <coughs> I mean, just joined them because I found them on a community with a Torque Three D. They have a, like the forums and stuff, and I started just. Uh, tell them <coughs> saying that I wanted to like work with anyone, you know, and they kind of were like, they were like, oh well, we're starting, uh, then we kind of need characters, we kind of need everything. And so I would say, um, well, I want to do characters because that's how I was more comfortable at the moment. And so they told me okay, and they would send me um, their characters so I can build on top of that, or they would tell me like, okay, do a monster. So I would just Google monsters, you know, and from making all those references, I kind of went molding my own monsters. And um, at one point they told me that um, they would pay me, like they wanted to pay me like 14 bucks for for the mesh because apparently I'm very good. What I was very good at them that caught their eye was at building the low poly mesh, the low poly meshes from scratch. But not my texture so much because my textures are lacking a lot to make it 
it's not that they're bad, but it's not what they're looking for. No. Um, yes, it looks awesome, but that's not what we're looking for. And that's the truth, you know. Because um, you know, when you're an artist, there's a lot of genres, you know, cartoon, realistic, or in between, or whatever they want, sci-fi-ish, 1980s, or whatever. Well, I, I, was, I probably always wanted to work at Blizzard. So for some reason, I, yeah. Well, for some reason, I went to their JavaScript ones because they post them online. And I did notice that 3D Mark was on the list. Yeah. I don't know if they're using 3D Mark, but... 3D Max. Oh, 3, yeah, 3D Max, sorry. It, I don't know if they're using it, but the, the tools that you're learning right now, can you just easily apply with something else? Like, it's the same things, so different different icon, I guess, or...? Uh, yes, within the films and game industry, and just drawing in 3D, because it has a lot of uh, exporters. You can export this to a lot of files, so you, uh, a lot of programs are used with this. So, <coughs> yeah. And if you want to get into like making CGI and all that stuff, you do need to uh, at least uh, a modeling program, because there's more, there's also free software <coughs> out there, like Rhino, that's the one they're using in UTPA. And there's also Blender, mm. but, um, uh, but 3D Max is like way more advanced, but you can still, apparently you can still do some stuff with Blender, some nice stuff, and other than Rhino and stuff, so. Um, this is the tool that I just stick with, you know, I'm very comfortable with. Um, also, I work with another independent developer very briefly, uh, but they wanted to use a software called Houdini, and it's more of a procedural art, because there's different, there's like two types of art that I know of. It's a procedural one, and it's constructive art, where you say to build a to build a table, you would say, well, I have a how many um, of this board? I have a board, and I have these pieces of metal, a certain amount of sizes, and I have screws, and I have wheels. So with that, you can build different varieties of a table, and that's called procedural art. And the one that I do is more of the destructive art, and it's just more like just going like um, uh, like I was doing like extruding faces and just going like kind of winging it and just going with like just doing the brush and just going with the art kind of. That's more of a destructive art but when you're a uh, constructive art and stuff you use other tools in Photoshop like all the, all the filters and all the uh, stuff that you can use all the tools without using the mouse too much. And that's more of a procedural because structural art. And that one is kind of awesome too. You know how to do that. <coughs> uh, I also wanted to go over, well, this was for character design. Um, anybody has any questions so far? So architecture, what I've noticed is a lot of, like a lot of squares. It's still a lot of basic geometry. It's just a lot of them. Um, another tool that I also wanted to look, go uh, go over was this schematics view. This right here tells you everything that all every object that you have in the scene. <coughs> so these are all the objects that I have, and I named them as very. Another important thing when you're making games is naming your stuff and uh, coming up with a very good naming convention for yourself. Of course, not for the computer. The computer doesn't care. But once you have, you're gonna have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of items, a lot of meshes, and a lot of textures. Uh, just a big, big library of textures. So you want to have a very good naming convention. Like uh, first, uh, I learned the hard way. Uh, I need to to not reuse the other textures because you want to reuse the same texture over and over because memory is very important when it comes to a video game. So if you're gonna have a wood texture, I'm gonna use this wood texture here and that door <coughs> right everywhere and those doors over there, I'm not gonna use a different wood texture. And if it's gonna be a black metal, I'm gonna use that black metal, I'm gonna use it there. 
you know, very rarely you would see a black metal. So you know, I would at first I want to show my the, these are all my um, my assets that I've been working on. As you can see, I named them buildings, cars, characters, doors, spotlights, streets, and textures. Right here, I use the same textures for everything. Wait. Notice that this is a backup from before, not on my new. Like you can see here, my textures are not in that great, and I'm still missing some textures. So I guess I haven't backed up my texture from my other computer where I work. Uh, right here, where it says brick white. Uh, after having so many <coughs> textures, I figured this is a, a completely <coughs> incorrect. Not that it's incorrect, but it, um, it's not it's not efficient for me to find it. Um, well, let me see. Okay, because before I think I had I had white first the color and then the type, <coughs> and it's better first to have the type like brick and then the color, so you can have them concrete, brown, and concrete. Because when you look at it from a list. You don't want to have red, 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 and then to find concrete, you want concrete red, and then you want to find metal red. Metal, if you want a red metal, you're going to find it in the metal section. You know, metal, and then the, the color that you want. Not the color first, and then the, the, that was one of the mistakes that I did, that I found later in production, that it wasn't helping me, and it would, it would have helped me better, so I have to rename all my textures. And on our also experience, I, I've started I restarted this project syndrome three times already. So, because, just to make it more efficient, and uh, since I've been learning how the Unreal Engine takes things and stuff, um, I later found out how it would be a better way so it could be faster and easier to do. So I did have to restart like three times already. And I'm thinking of restarting again one more time <laughs> from scratch. Like to create the same, same scenario. So <coughs> here on the Unreal Engine is where, where you have all your folders for your characters, your blueprints. So you kind of do need a very good naming convention so you can find these later and modify these. And you do need to be very organized. Right here you see a bunch of squares on top of this, and that's because uh, you also have to specify the collision. And the collision in the video games is very expensive. You don't want to use a collision as more than a cube. You don't, you don't want to use like... Right there, I have them in a group. So when I can select them, it selects all of that. So I ungroup them, and you can see here. Oh, I just want that one. And that's, that's a building that I made with some texture. And <coughs> you, you have to, like I said, specify the collision. So you kind of just make the, a box. Just to because uh, let's say if I would specify this as a collision, it has already a lot of meshes, and each mesh costs memory. So you don't want all these spaces <coughs> to have collision. You just want one phase. The, um, it would be less expensive in the programming of the game. Right now, how you would export stuff to the Unreal Engine? You once you have what you have, then you select it. Either you go to here export and you can export the whole thing, the whole scene, but I don't want to do that. I just want to export selected. And what um, it just depends on the on the game engine that you use. And 
Right now, uh, Unreal Engine uses FBX format. The FBX format. I know um, Torque 3D uses this one, the Autodesk Collab B8E. So you just select the format depending on the engine that you're using, and then you name it. I named this bag Milky Way bag. Milky Way bag. And then you just hit save. And this FBX format is going to ask you if you want the animation to embed the, the the media means the textures, which I don't like, want that because I want to handle that in Unreal Engine. Because <coughs> the Unreal Engine has a very powerful material, material tech, material, <coughs> material pro tool to use your materials here. Um, let's see. This is a material editor in, in uh, Unreal, right here. It, they have this thing called blueprints where it's more visual scripting and here you tell this <coughs> this is the JPEG that I saved out so you bring it in here and you have to connect it to be the base color and then here you can specify the roughness of it um, if I take this off it's going to be glossy and I don't want that so I have to put the roughness to one and you can put like to make it me look metallic like you can see here, this thing has a lot of options and you really have to dig into them and to unrealengine.com and they, they do provide with information. Oh, right now, I'm just going to make a, a linear hit one for the shape a value. I want it to be one because for metallic, a zero is no and one is yes. So if I want it to be metallic, I will put it one. But this roughness and metallic don't work together, so if you really want the metallic texture, you want the, the roughness out. And you can see here. Um, that brick texture was used, I believe, in the 201 mark. You now it looks kind of metallic. you really have to to understand what your genre is going to be and your demographic the demographics is the people that you're going to set it to and once you get that when you start with that let's say the genre i want a third person shooter and it's going to be an rpg he's going to get skills and there's going to be zombies and stuff so you write all that down and so you and then you start with your design and building characters up like why are they there why is the people going to play your game why is it going to be fun? What's going to be the objective? All these questions you have to answer them and then bring up in your design. And any uh, any questions that you guys might have? So in a 3D game, um, you have, you, I know you're developing the characters right now. So you use something like Unreal Engine to, to do everything else, the physics of it? Yes, the physics and the animation. Well, the animations, you do them in 3D Max and then you import a, using each the one. Bones, I guess, or huh? Using defining the bones or yeah. Um, once you define the bones in 3D Max, you you do all that say a run animation, and then that specific animation you save it as a run animation, and then you you import that specific animation to Unreal, and then let's say you also want your idle animation, so you make your idle animation in 3D Max, and then you export it, you save it out, or export it as FBX. <coughs> you import it here to, to Unreal, and then in Unreal Engine is where you're going to tell it when they're going to be blended and when is that animation going to play, and because you don't want them to just be playing all the time. You really have to specify, okay, when the character starts moving forward, the Unreal Engine detects that their speed or the object that, that's the player, then he's going to play the run animation. And if it sees, there's this setting called, if he's falling, then he's playing the jump animation. Like if, if the physics detects that it's falling, then you'll play the, the, the fall animation. And then of course when you click on the fire button, that's when I want the point animation to go up. So you kind of have to blend all these animations 
at the correct time, and you have to tell Unreal Engine how to do that. I heard with the Unreal Engine, you can actually produce mobile games right now mm -hmm. with, the, with the same tools, right? Yes. You know, you, once you create your game here, you can just um, you can package your code for Android, <coughs> iOS, Linux, and Windows. So what does that mean, package it? Do you get like a, an executable that goes mm -hmm. onto the device and that's it? That's all you have to do? Yeah. <coughs> so you build a menu inside of Unreal. Mm -hmm. The menu? Well, like the, the UI? The UI, yeah, yes. the logic. Like they have so the you UI start the game and... Mm -hmm. You build everything first on the computer and then you just... Because before, it wasn't that easy at first. <coughs> this is a big feature. And also, uh, Unity is is better in that. They have way more platforms. They have like one or something they boast about it. But um, that's something difficult to do because before, if you wanted to put out a game for PC, you had to program it for PC. And if you want to put out a game for PlayStation, you have to program it for that. So multiple games, when they would come out, oh, there's it's going to come out for, PC, for PS3, Xbox, and PC. They have to make three games. Basically. And now, <coughs> with technologies, they don't. Mm. So not a lot of game engines have that. Like the Tor 3D, it's, it supports some platforms, but not a lot. Be the, what would be the first step to get started, like to play the base? What do you mean? Like to uh, go to unrealengine.com and then starting the engine? Unreal. And then there's also like, you click on the website, like what is un Unreal, um, how getting started, there is a getting started site, you know, and it tells you, you just go reading. You just really have to dedicate the time to study about it and read about it. And it's all there in unrealengine.com and how to use their engine. <coughs> I've gone through it. Yeah. Will they require you to use 3D Max or? No. As long as uh, your 3D modern um, package, your program supports uh, FBX, the XPX exporter. And a lot of them do. <coughs> FBX is, is uh, one of the oldest exporters. I know, I know Rhino exports to FBX. Uh, Blender too. Any other questions, guys? Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a uh,